Well, we're talking about relevant gospel. Now, I just want to make sure I'm clear. The gospel is always relevant. It's the listeners sometimes that aren't receptive. And what our job as the proclaimers of the gospel, what our job is as the truth speakers, the truth tellers, we are to find relevant ways to get the gospel to the person in need of it. And who's in need of the gospel? The whole world. We don't classify those that are worthy of it. Like we don't look at somebody whose life is a mess and go, they get, they've got what they deserve. That's called Phariseeism. That's called ego. That's called antichrist. That is nothing like Jesus. Jesus does not. Here's the qualification for the gospel message from Jesus Christ. Breath. Breath in their lungs. A beating of their heart. And Jesus says, I'm not willing that any, any, any should perish. God is in love with his creation. And he wants to reconcile the plan. The plan has been jacked up by sin. And we understand that. And we live in a world, to be quite honest with you, that doesn't understand that. They don't understand that the world is hemorrhaging in sin. No one told them the creation story. They've now been, for a generation, being taught that creation is a myth and evolution is a fact. They've been told that, that the God of the Bible is just one of many, many, many gods. And they don't have a clear understanding of who God is about creation. And so they don't understand that they are lost. They look at this world and they see all of the bad things happening. And they think this, if there is a God, and there probably isn't, this is what they're thinking, then how could he let this happen on this earth? And if they just could understand how we got into the mess we're in, they would understand that all of the bad on the earth is not by God's hand. It's not at God's doing. It is, it is transgressing God's original plan of relationship and rule of this planet. And so what we have to do is we have to realize that we can preach a gospel to them that takes for granted the foundation, that takes for granted that, that, that this, 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 everybody knows who God is and everybody knows what sin is. And if we teach that assuming they understand it, then we will actually have a very relevant gospel, but through our language be giving an irrelevant message. I want to tell you what relevant means. If I could put the dictionary definition back up there. Relevant means this. We looked at this last week. Closely connected or appropriate to what is being done or considered. So what is being done or considered is inside the person that the gospel message is coming to. And if it's going to be a relevant message, we have to connect it to their considerations and their understanding. And that's sometimes tough to do. How many of you are married? So you know it's tough to get the other person sometimes to understand what you're saying and what you're meaning by that. Right? And that, that's the person you love. Imagine how hard it is for the people that you've never even considered in your life before. To walk up to them and, and try to get closely connected. Well, the way you get closely connected is something that's under attack in this world, and that is through community. We've now made community something you can do in your mom's basement with a screen in front of your face. We've made community something that when someone says something you don't like, you don't need, need to politely dismiss yourself from the conversation. You just unfriend them in a click. And so community, getting closely connected to your next door neighbors is tough now. If you're like, um, if you're our neighbor, you know there's a house there and there's people there sometimes, but they're hardly ever there. Our house is just there. It's there. It's a place we land between appointments. It's, we have a crazy busy life. So it's hard to be closely connected as our neighbor. And so there's a lot of things that we have to overcome in this culture. Uh, the next definition of relevant is appropriate to the current time period or circumstances of contemporary interest. So there's a lot of circumstances going on right now. Everybody in our world is walking around with the entire world attached to them. Everyone in the world is attached to them. They can call anyone almost on the planet from their hip. It's amazing. There's never been a time like this in the history of the world. And we just are so used to it that it, it, it doesn't even really can change any of our approach. And I'm telling you, it's time to think about how the approach of the church might be becoming a little bit dated 
when we say everybody get to church at this time on Sunday. Is that okay to say out loud? Now, I love this time on Sunday. But what we're going to have to do is how many of you know the gospel isn't just for 10 a.m.ers? Or 9 a.m.ers, you early birds, right? Um, so we talked about this last week. We talked about how a, a survey was done in the church and 65% of people in the church between 20 and 30, 20 and 29, believe, 65% believe that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. And I, I need to say this. That's not the qualifications of getting to heaven. You're going to find out that there's some bad people that go to heaven. Anybody hear about the thief on the cross that was guilty of stealing and worthy of crucifixion? How many of you say that's a good person? How many of you say he's in heaven? See, what gets you to heaven is Jesus. So a bad, and by the way, we're the ones that made up the scale of good and bad. A bad person, and I'm using the terminology, on the cross, suffering a deserved punishment for being a sinner, met Jesus Christ, put his faith and trust in him, and ended up in heaven. And here's what's going to shock some people. They're going to get to heaven and find out the baddest dude in their town's there. Here's what's equally shocking. There's going to be some people that get to hell and realize some really good people. It's not about you being good or bad, but that's what so many people... You know what's happened? When people in the church believe this, that if you're good, you get to heaven, the church is failing. And so what we want to do is we want to come into this series, and we're going to continue on with how do we understand the culture and the people that we're bringing the gospel to in such a way that we can very relevantly... Tell the gospel. I've got to share this with the church. I don't want to take a ton of time to do it. But something happened last week in the second service that really just makes this point. And in the second service last week, I got, I got near the end of the message. And man, I just felt very strongly by the Holy Spirit to, to give an illustration. It was one I didn't give in the first service. And I started talking about how as a father, I'm trying to be relevant to my children. It's really tough sometimes, isn't it, as, a, as, a, as an old, crusty dad. Right. And who, who is and I don't know what's happened to me as I've gotten older. It's almost like a spirit has overcome me and dad jokes just come to my mind like like rapid fire. I mean, and, and they're corny as I'll get out. But, man, they're so funny to me in this in the spirit realm that I live in now that I, I have to give utterance to this dad joke. And so I know that it's going to get collective moans. I know no one in my family is in the same spiritual plane that I'm in to understand that this joke is stinking hilarious. And But there's something that comes over, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. But I have to tell the dad joke. And so I tell this dad joke, and I know that my kids have not gotten to a place in their life yet that they can appreciate the, the depth of the humor that just... Proceeded out of the mouth of the Father. And so they just deem me irrelevant. Anybody else picking up what I'm doing now? Anyway, that's not the illustration. But I was trying to be relevant to Peyton two weeks ago. And Peyton, two weeks ago, came up to me. And he, after the service, we were about to leave. And Tammy was out of town at Disneyland by herself, which I'm not even going to talk about. Because what mother just randomly goes to Disneyland with her children at home and then sends pictures in front of the castle of, hey, we decided to go to Disneyland. It's like, okay, you know what? Shut up. You don't have to share that with the family. My kids are like, why, why is mom at Mickey Mouse's house? I'm like, well, because mom is a cheater and she hates you and that's why I'm the good parent. And, and, and you know what? The second she walked in the door, she was completely forgiven. If I had done that, I would still be paying penance to my family. But anyway, Tammy wasn't here. So I had all the kids. And so at church ends, and Peyton comes up, and he's like, Dad, we got to go home. And I'm like, no, we're going to Morganton. We're going to grab something to eat. i got to buy your sister an uh, outfit because I'm taking her on a little date tomorrow night. And I promised her we'd get her outfit. He's like, no, we got to go home. Dad, we got to go home. I said, slow your roll. Why do we have to go home? He said, Dad, at 1 o'clock, the purple cube on Fortnite is going to explode. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. 
Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Irrelevant. All of you are irrelevant, just as irrelevant as I was. But I love my son. Call me crazy, but I, I, I saw things in this boy that I wish were there for, like, homework and for his sister's welfare, you know. But these things were alive and well in him. He was passionate. He was determined. He had character. He was motivated. These are all good words. And I'm looking at my son, and I'm like, he's like, Dad, the purple cube is going to explode at 1 o'clock. And if I'm not home, all of my friends are rushing home to see it. We're all going to go together. Get this. We're going to go together at our separate homes into a game, to a certain level of the game, to watch this cube explode. I don't have time to tell the entire illustration, but last week, I really just talked that out. And I told the story of it. And to be honest, uh, it was pretty beautiful. <laughs> at 1 o'clock, at 12.58, I realized that my son and all of his friends upstairs, I could hear them through the TV speakers, uh, that were talking to each other, playing a video game, which is crazy. Imagine what Mario Brothers would have been like if you could have been talking to your friend. <laughs> but anyway, they're talking to each other, and they're playing this game, and I realized they're still getting dressed. What are you going to wear to watch the cube explode? What skin are you going to put on? Oh, I, they, my son is worried about his fashion inside of a video game to see something that I could not buy his sister a real outfit so that he could get home and watch this thing explode. And I realize at 12.58, they're still talking about what they're going to wear, which I don't know a ton, but I know enough about video games to know. If you're still picking out what you look like, you're not in the game yet. So I walk upstairs and I'm like, hey, bud. He's like, yeah. I said, it's 12.58. Pandemonium broke out. It's 12.58. Do y'all hear that? My dad said it's 12. Oh, my goodness, it's 12.58. Wear whatever you've got on. And they have to, they have to parachute into the game. They, they all have to kind of pick the same level to be there together to witness at the same time. They have to pick the right game. I mean, battle royale. Which one? I don't know. And they, they get in. They're parachuting into the game. How many of you have a clue what I'm talking about? And man, they're coming into the game and, and, and they landed in the wrong area and off in the distance in this game you can see this purple purple line going up to the heavens and I'm like, hey, is that it over there? He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you have a long way. He's like, running. Just as fast as he can. I said, you picked a great skin because your cape is flapping beautifully while you're running across the world to get to the purple cube. And he's running. And finally, one of his friends, or, or, or he did, I can't remember, but somebody said, we got to steal a vehicle. <laughs> and as a father that just preached on Sunday morning, I'm like, yeah, get a vehicle, man. Steal someone's vehicle. And they stole a golf cart. <laughs> And two guys jumped in the back. One guy jumped in the front. Of course, it took Medfair who gets to drive. I'm like, what's the matter, man? And they're driving this golf cart. And, and sure enough, they get there. And this purple cube is hovering in the air. And, and I hear Hayden. <laughs> Gotta love Hayden. Is he, is he, do we miss it? And Hayden says to Hayden, I hope not. And then all of a sudden, the cube starts to slowly turn. Pandemonium breaks out again. I hear them through the speakers. It's moving! It's moving on your screen! It's moving on my screen! The purple cube is turning! It's moving! And then I'm, I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm all right. So I sit down. I'm like, I'm here! I'm here! I, I, I'm into this now! It starts, it starts rotating. And then it goes just a little faster. And then through the speakers, this bass sounds like... Their guns and all their stuff were falling out of their pockets. But 
and, it, and, it, and they fly backwards. And, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, the screen goes black. And they're back to shooting again. It's blown them off the surface of the Fortnite world. And where the cube was is now a new level of gameplay. And they're falling into it. And Peyton, my 10-year-old son, looks over at me with a tear <laughs> in the corner of his eye. And if you know Peyton, he's very... Tears are the height of everything emotional. Happy, sad. Just when, when he gets to the height of emotion, tears. He looked over at me and goes, It's beautiful, Dad. I said, Yes, son. And you wore the perfect outfit for this. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened last week. I told that story. And then I said, I'm worried. I'm worried that our kids are going to think that's the greatest story ever told. And I started to describe our Savior. On a cross, all of eternity past and all of eternity future was looking to that cross. And you have to get there. And it doesn't matter what you wear. You just have to get there. And I started to tell about this moment on the cross where everything for all of humanity hung in the balance. And, and our Savior took everything upon himself. And he started to, to, to die. And he looked up to heaven. And the Father turned his back on his Son. And I told the story of the gospel. I got to tell you what happened last week. I gave the gospel and we finished the service and a teenage boy, a seventh grader that had never been to our church before came with one of his coaches from his school and he walked up to me in the lobby and he said, very awkwardly, nervously, you know, teenagers don't talk to adults, right? You say hi to them, they're like, mm. <laughs> He kind of came up and he, he may be here today. I'm so proud of him. He came up and he goes, um, Thank you. And I said, man, you're, you're welcome. He's like, uh, I want to I give you something. He pulled out a $10 bill, which is roughly what a skin costs in the game. And he said, I, I, I want you to have this. And I'm like, why? He said, you're the greatest preacher I've ever heard. Now stop, stop. Why did that kid think I was the greatest preacher he ever heard? Because I'm not. So that's not the point. The point is, I don't know how many times he's been to church, but for the first time, the gospel was received by him in a relevant way that made sense to him. How many of you know heaven didn't mind the seven minutes it took me in a message? to tell the Fortnite story. And I'll tell you what else. There was, in the second service, for whatever reason, there was more young teenage kids and, and more children. I looked back in this back section and there was five boys that come regularly that normally have their face down doodling or something. They were on the edge of their seat and I watched their mother just, while I'm telling the story, she's just watching them. Completely maybe for the first time, completely engaged in the gospel message. Guys, I'm telling you, I, I was convicted of the Holy Spirit to tell that story, and I didn't know when I started where it was going. And when it was finished, and I saw what I saw, and that boy's reaction was what it was, heaven confirmed to me that we are on to something here. And it's nothing new. Now, what we're going to do over these next couple of weeks is we're going to take a look at the fact that we're not the first people to do this. We might be the first people to do this around here, but we're not the first people to do this. And so I want to take you to the book of Acts, Acts chapter number two. You might recognize this. This is one of the greatest evangelistic uh, events in all of the Bible, only outdone by, honestly, recent revivals in our world. A thousand years probably went past and we don't have any record of 3,000 people getting saved at one event. It was, the, it was called Pentecost Sunday. How many of you have heard of Pentecost Sunday in the Bible? Okay, here's what was going on. Jesus has died, risen, and ascended. 
Peter is now, uh, one of the things, if you remember Peter, he denied Christ three times. And, and, and Jesus told him, one day when you are converted, you will strengthen the brethren. There's this moment happening. And, and you, you might think of Pentecost Sunday like, like we do church, like they finished all of the specials. And then the preacher with his prepared sermon stood up and walked up and took the microphone. That's not at all how it happened. Pentecost Sunday was very organic. They were all there. There was a lot of people that spoke different languages there. They, they, they really couldn't understand each other. There was a lot of confusion in the area. And all of a sudden, this, this maybe 21-year-old kid named Peter just remembers that God told him that he was going to build his church and that the gates of hell weren't going to stand against it. And this, this young, 21-roughly-year-old man Stands up and starts to say something. And what comes out of his next uh, mouth next, and we're going to look at it, is a very relevant conversation to the crowd he was talking to. Um, I won't read the first part of the chapter for sake of time, but that's where you're going to read about tongues and you're going to read about how a miracle was taking place because they were speaking and everybody from their own nation was understanding what was happening. How many of you know that got their attention? So sometimes relevance is doing something that gets the attention of the world. Well, I don't know why our church is doing this. You know, it's pretty expensive. We're trying to get their attention. In a world that does not need Jesus, there's nothing wrong with me. I was born this way. Why do I need saving from this? Because we've removed what Genesis teaches, they don't realize that what we have in these last days are inordinate affections. They don't realize that it's really, really bizarre to want to put black tar heroin into your vein to go on some sort of a trip. That actually makes sense on some level to them. And they don't understand that that is not a natural desire. They think everyone wants to do that. They don't understand that that gay marriage is an anomaly to the way God created human beings. It's as weird as a horse and a cow being attracted to each other. It's not the way God designed creation. And you say, that's politically incorrect. You're going to get in trouble for saying that. I know it's politically incorrect, but the Bible is very clear. The reason it's politically incorrect is because politically the world has no understanding of Genesis and no understanding of creation. And so I was born this way. It's wrong for you to tell me. No, what we actually need to do is help you understand you weren't born that way. You were born in transgresses and sins because of the original sin in Genesis chapter 3. But because the church has just talked about the gospel and we start with a manger and we end with an empty tomb, we have lost the foundation and now we have an entire generation of people that don't need God. And so we stand up and say, you need the gospel. And they're like, why? Just because you don't approve of my lifestyle? It has nothing to do with my approval. Just because you don't approve of some some things I do on Friday night? No, no, that's not what the church... How did we get painted into a corner of being intolerant? I'll tell you how. We've lost the foundation. And now the church is just standing up saying, you know, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And they're like, we don't need to see anything great. We kind of think it's great as it is. Thank you very much. We now live in a post-Christian country. What I mean by that is this. We used to be on Judeo-Christian values. And Obama said this, and he got a lot of flack from the Christian world. Uh, We should have woke up and listened to the obvious statement. When he said we're no longer a Christian nation, we should have woke up and said, do we care? Instead, we declared him wrong. I propose to you, look around. We have over 150 churches in this county. How are we doing? I'd say it's a post-Christian nation. And I don't intend to get to heaven and give an account to my God for the life that I've spent. I guess I'd say it this way, not on my watch and not on your watch. And this is what our church is about. It's about taking this timeless gospel to a culture that doesn't even know they need it. 
And our first obstacle is to figure out how to get them to understand they need it. Now, I want to talk to you about Acts, and I want to tell you all that's going on here. You remember this timeline I gave you? Can you throw up the timeline from the last series? I'm going to bring it into this one. I told you this is the entirety of the Bible in the simplest outline I can ever give you. Genesis 1 and 2, God has relationship and he rules Adam and Eve. And it's going swimmingly. He spends time with them in the morning. He walks with them in the cool of the day. He, he, he's in relational communion with them. The, everything, the, every need they could have is there. They're still responsible for tending the garden and for caring for the garden and naming the animals. They're helping him rule through relationship. And then in Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes and he tells a lie. And, and they buy the lie, hook, line, and sinker, that God just doesn't love them and he doesn't want them to be like him. And if they would eat of this fruit, they'd be as him. And so they buy the lie and they take it and they eat the fruit and God comes back the next day. And guess what? Now they're clothed. They're hiding. They're trying to cover themselves from him. There's no true intimacy and transparency anymore. They are living a life of, of walls and protection because we, don't, we, we now know that we are naked. And that, that says so much more than the physical nudity of it if you understand what goes on in our lives. Now let's fast forward to the end. Revelation. This is the last two chapters in the Bible. Revelation 20 and 21 talks about... A millennial kingdom where God, we're going to be in relationship and rule with God. That is what's going to happen at the end of days. That God is going to have relationship with us. We are going to live with him in my father's house. Our many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And he says, I'm going to come again and receive you. And we're going to be in relationship. I am going to be your God. You are going to be my people. And I am. we are going to rule together in the millennial reign. He is going to set us up as rulers just like he set up Adam and Eve. That's God's plan. The entirety of everything in the Bible between Genesis chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 19 is all about the rescue plan. Because God's will done on earth as it is in heaven is the prayer that we are supposed to be praying. And so we want God's will done. And you'll notice it's going to happen God's way. You have a choice. Are you going to believe the gospel or not? Are you going to become a part of the church, the bride of Christ, or not? Are you going to accept him as your savior or not? So what we have to do is we have to understand, why would anybody choose relational rule if there's no reason to? If there's no brokenness, if everything's okay on the planet. Do you know when God sent a flood to the earth to destroy the earth, he was so fed up with mankind. It was during the time, it was right at the end of the time of the judges. And let me tell you something about the judge, time of the judges. The time of the judges was when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So it didn't matter what God thought. Everybody just felt I was born this way. I feel good. By the way, do you understand how bad it could be when you, you, you could do anything that's right in your own eyes? Anybody have road rage? What you feel like doing in that moment qualifies as right in your own eyes. That means murder is okay because as long as the murderer felt like it was justified, then he can murder. You can identify as anything you want to identify as as long as you... Feel like that's what you want to identify as. You can, you can put anything into your body as long as it feels good at the time that you do it. You can drink as much as you want. You can smoke as much as you want. You can, you can eat all the junk food you want to eat. You can just destroy your body in a various number of ways. And it's okay. Because it feels good to you. Do it. This is the attitude of our culture. And then we come to that and say, well, here's what you should want. And they're going, oh, no, it's not what I should want. Where do you get off telling me what I should want? I know what I want. And rather than tell them what they should want, what if we told them the glorious story of our Savior, which begins here, and that we are never supposed to be scared of that word, rule? It rules. The idea that being in submission is a bad thing is to never have understood submission. To be subject to a king that treats you like a father should 
that's a problem because most of us have experiences with a father that treated us as he shouldn't. So when we hear about a God that reminds us of the father, we're kind of like, we don't have any time for that. We don't need that. I'm doing fine without a father. Thank you very much. It's really become an issue. Now, here's what I want to do. I'm going to take this same chart, not to confuse you. I'm going to stand it up for a second. Okay. So let me, let's stand it up with this picture. Here's the same chart. Okay. This is, this is Genesis 1 and 2. God, creation, sin, and that's why death. Here's the middle part. Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Here's the other. The consummation of all things. No more death. Ruling and reigning with him in that millennial kingdom. Okay, all we've done is stood the chart up. Okay, everybody got that? Here's what's wrong with the church today. We are just preaching this. Power and hope. We are coming to the world and we're telling them the power of the cross gives them a hope like they've never... And by the way, that is true. This is what Billy Graham was able to preach in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And, and the world was completely falling on their knees and accepting Christ as Savior. Because the world had a general understanding that there is a God. We were a Judeo-Christian nation. All of this false lying gods had not made its way into our culture yet. And sin, everybody knew what that was. Sin was when you do bad things. Now, what's bad? So, so the church was able to be a little bit, if I could say the word lazy, we didn't have to educate on the foundation. We just preached power and hope. And man, salvations were happening. Sawdust trails were getting piled. The altars were packed. I mean, it was unbelievable. Acts chapter 2, Peter gets to preach the same way. And by the way, it's relevant because of the listeners. I want to show you the relevance of, of Acts chapter 2. i got to hurry and we'll get out of here. Acts chapter 2 verse 14 is where we start. And remember what's going on here. They're all speaking and they're understanding each other even though they speak different languages. It was miraculous. But Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice. This is that 21-year-old kid. And he said to them, ye men of Judea. And all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So everybody was hearing and they're like, boy, are we all on some sort of a trip here? How are we understanding these guys from Galilee? We're not drunk. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Why is that a big deal that he goes back and quotes the prophet Joel? He's being relevant to the Jews. The Jews highly esteemed their prophets from the Old Testament, of which Joel was one of. He's speaking to them in their understanding. And they're like, oh, Joel, we like that. And he's already saying, see, we're, we're talking about what you understand. And it shall come to pass in the last days, this is what Joel said, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all of them were like, yep, that's what Joel said. We know the whole thing. We've got it memorized. That's what Joel said. He's making a relevant case to them from their understanding. He goes on. Verse, uh, let's see, where was that? Verse 18, is that where we're at? And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord come. Now you might not understand that, but let me tell you what all the Jews were doing in the crowd that day. That's what he said. You're right. That's it. We understand it. That's relevant. We get it. You're, we are picking up what you're putting down. We are tracking. Not only can we understand what you're saying verbally... But we already have a foundational belief that Joel was a prophet sent from God and we understand his words. Do you see what's happening? So Peter's speaking to them very relevantly to the where they are in their world. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By the way, that's the gospel. Amen. And so Peter, Peter was like, hey, let me tell you something. This is what Joel said. If you call upon the name of the Lord, ye shall be saved. The Jews had no problem with that because one day the Lord is coming, the Messiah. They just didn't believe it was Jesus. Remember, they killed him. So they still had no problem with this message. They're like, that's right, the Lord's coming. Watch what he does next. He's got them right in their relevant mindset. And he says this in the next 
By the way, this is one of the greatest revivals. 3,000 people are about to get saved because Peter took the timeless gospel and made it relevant to the audience that was listening. Don't miss what I'm saying. Verse 21, uh, or 22. Ye men of Israel. Hey guys, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel. That's a pretty big highfalutin group of Jews. And foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. Now, right about here, there's mind friction going on in the crowd. There might even be anger going on in the crowd. Who does this young punk think he is scolding us? But because he went about it relevantly, they were doing this, and then they went, er, what? And something they had never considered, as they were screaming, crucify him, all of a sudden, because of the relevant presentation of the gospel, now he was able to bring them to a screeching halt, a very important moment, a moment when you see yourself possibly, maybe for the first time, possibly in need of the gospel. And they just went, yeah, that's good, that's good, yeah, Joel, we know Joel, yep, that's what Joel said, yes, he did. What? We're lost. We didn't notice the Messiah when he walked among us. Then he goes on. He doesn't doesn't stop because if he stops right now, there's a debate and a battle. He just kind of keeps rolling. He says, you know, the foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified. Whom God raised up, uh, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. He goes on and just says, look, I'm not here to condemn you. Where a lot of churches do is the second when they get to something that the, the crowd isn't doing right, I think I'll just park right there. Come on. You crucified the Savior. You dirty, rotten scoundrels. I can't believe you're doing what you're doing. You should get right with God and apologize for crucifying the Savior. That's not what he did. This is what happened. But God, the God of the timeline, wanted relational rules. You know what he did? He trumped your wicked plan with an unbelievable resurrection. And I'm not going to get stuck on your sin. I'm going to get stuck on the gospel. And so he just keeps, I love what Peter does. Man, this 21-year-old was moving. He was shaking and baking. It's almost like he'd spent three years getting to know Jesus. Would to God that churches and pastors would get to know the one we talk about. Because it would not change our message. It would change our delivery. It is time for the churches of the South to quit screaming at the homosexuals and start recognizing that the gospel loves them and is going to change their lives in time. But God is long-suffering. He's patient. Hey, God is going to change these lives of the the meth addicts in our county. God is going to change the lives of the broken homes in our county. He's just not going to do it on your time schedule. And if you start getting all ugly and parking where you shouldn't be parking with your message, he might just have to go find another messenger. And we are not parking on the gross parts of sin. By the way, I serve a God that already paid for those sins. Why I should get in the mud and start throwing forgiven sins in the face of people makes no sense to the gospel message I understand in the Bible. I am not compromising. I am focusing on the truth of the gospel. You can call me what you want to call me. They can call this church what they want to call this church. But I'm telling you right now, we are faced, are faced like a flint focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we are trying to get a relevant conversation started. And ostracizing everybody that comes to the table because all are sinners is a really foolish way to bring salvation to the people. Verse 26. Therefore did my heart rejoice. Right about the time they think they're about to get a tongue lashing, 
Peter's like, my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. You killed my Jesus. He came out of the grave. I ain't mad about it. I don't condemn you. I am pumped. I'm excited. God's good. Whoa, kind of thought you were about to backhand us there, but it turns out you're not enraged at me. No, no, not at all. <laughs> thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy. Uh, I skipped some verses, didn't I? Yeah, verse 25. Stay on the screen, Ritter. For David speaketh. Why did he bring up David? Because the Jews loved him some David. David was the good king after Saul. David, I mean, you can right now go to Jerusalem, and if you stay in one of the nicest hotels, you're in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. It's a five-star. David is like their favorite of all the kings. There's King David Highway. There's, there's David this, David that. I mean, you can go someplace and get the David Burger. I mean, they love David. And so P Peter's like, all right, let's talk about something you love. Let me get real relevant with you. For David speaketh concerning him, Jesus Christ, he's making the connection. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. And they're all going, yeah, we remember when David said that. We know the Bible very well. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Next verse. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. David said all this. Keep going. Verse 28. Or 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. By the way, did David go to hell? But David's seed went to hell in the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus, a descendant of the lineage of David, his soul went to hell and paid your sin debt. But God did not leave his soul in hell. Did we switch to verse? Go back, 27. You did not leave Dave, uh, Jesus' soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, capital H, capital O, talking of Jesus, to see corruption. Jesus is not staying in the grave. He is not staying in hell. David knew it. And right about now, they're like, we love us and David. David thought that too? Well, if David thought it, maybe this guy locally that's yelling and screaming at us at the Jewish synagogue now it's all up for grabs, right? He very relevantly walked into their mindset and he starts unpacking in a beautiful way the gospel and he's using the, the prophets and patriarchs they believe in. You know what he's doing? He's talking about the purple cube on Fortnite. And then the next second, you, 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 you don't even take a hesitation. The next second, you start talking about the Savior and all these kids are like, well, it was like heaven. And I get to tell them, look, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for us. The creators of Fortnite, as awesome as it was, okay. <laughs> I am 42. So you grow up, preacher, it's not awesome. You keep telling it's awesome, I'm going to have to spend more money. Loose your money, sit down with your son and watch and figure out a way you can bring the gospel into his young life. It's your son. It's your grandson. It's your daughter. It's your granddaughter. It's their friends. It's the community. You don't have to change who you are. You just have to be relevant enough to figure out how to, how could this be told in a Jesus way? Because I got one note. Ding, 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 ding. I'm trying to figure out how to get this note into every single song. How do I get the gospel into every community touch that we have? How do you get it into the water cooler conversation tomorrow? How do you get it into your, your, your standing around talking after work conversation? And by the way, you don't have to go, can I have your attention? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And that means all of my coworkers are sin and heathen. Is it true? Pretty irrelevant to pitch it that way. I was walking with my family through Times Square. God love him. This God loving man was screaming hellfire and brimstone at everybody that walked by. 
I saw him in the morning. I saw him in the afternoon. I saw him the next morning. I saw him the next afternoon. Can I tell you what I never saw? I never saw anybody speaking to him. I never saw him making a contact. In fact, in Times Square, where it was shoulder to shoulder people, there was this open space all around him as the entire crowd just kind of went. Mm. And this is why our churches are empty. So the world drives by the church and they go, mm, not this time. I don't need to be condemned. I don't need to be hated. Oh, that we would have the wisdom of Peter. You can go on and finish reading. It's unbelievable how relevant Peter was. Hey, next week, you know what we're gonna do next week? We're gonna go to another revival with another preacher named Paul. Only next week, he's not speaking to the Jews. Paul's speaking to the Greeks. Get this. Paul, I've been there. It's in Greece. There's a place called Mars Hill. We ought to call next week's message a, a Christian on Mars. <laughs> he, he's on Mars Hill, and Mars Hill is right across the street from this higher hill. And on top of that higher hill is a building called the Acropolis. Anybody been there? The Acropolis was the temple of the goddess Diane. Diane was the goddess of love, and Aphrodite. And these Greeks, let me tell you what was going on right across the street from where Paul was preaching this next message. I don't mean to be inappropriate, but the way they worshiped the goddess of love was every manner of sexual impurity you could ever imagine. Orgies, men with men, women with women, it was all good in the hood as long as it made sense to them. And in the shadow of that filth, Paul, and I, I just can't wait to get to heaven. All I want to know when I get to heaven is did Paul have a toga on? <laughs> If he wore a toga, I'm so happy because I think he was relevant. I could see him going, I'm walking in there looking all Jewish. Put a little wreath around his head, a little white toga. Looked like he was at some college campus in the 21st century. Alpha, beta, kappa. And he walked up there on Mars Hill. And you're not going to believe what he does. We'll talk about it next week. It's unbelievable. I'm trying to be relevant. This, this city, this county, this country needs relevance. Not, not more than they need the gospel in order that they can hear the gospel. That's what's needed. I hope you'll join us next week. It's going to be a fun time. It's going to be a good time. Oh, we've got a lot to talk about. It's going to be great. You know what I'm excited about? December 16th. There's going to be people that come to church not wanting to be at church. They're going to come to church wanting to be at Walmart. And I'm okay with that. And there's, there might even be one knucklehead Christian that goes, why are they going to dress like that to come to church? They dress like that to go to Walmart. And if you know anything about the way you dress to go to Walmart, <laughs> you don't dress to go to Walmart. Walmart happens in whatever you're wearing. So put your little pious Christian attitude in your back pocket and, and let, just be okay with they came to Walmart and church happened on the way. And I, I hope church happens in their hearts. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be incredible if a Christian became one in his pajamas on the way to Walmart at church? be the greatest Sunday we've had this year, I promise you. <coughs> Father, Lord, I love you. Lord, help us as Christians to understand why we're breaking so many traditions. It's not because the traditions don't work, but because the people that appreciate the traditions are dying or dead. And we're living in a world where our own children think the way to heaven is to be good. And by the way, they get to decide what's good. Which means everyone is on their way to hell thinking they're on their way to heaven. And the church is screaming in the center of Times Square, but the world is walking around the church. And 
God, it's our fault. I'm asking your forgiveness this morning as a preacher of the gospel that has done it in so many irrelevant ways. I ask for forgiveness. I ask for your endorsement as we become more relevant with the same timeless truth that both Peter and Paul had. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you in your name. Amen. If you are here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to be standing in the back. I've got staff around. You can come right up to next steps in the lobby. We would love to show you how you could know Jesus Christ as your Savior. We're not going to strong arm you. We're not going to guilt you into it. We're just going to be there ready for when you're ready. And I would really, really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, the gospel with you.